Lord, by God's grace and mercy, we are well. Welcome, everyone, especially those who are watching from different parts of the world. We welcome you in the name of the Lord. Let's pray together. We're in Psalm 114, 115, and I'll explain why we're reading both. Thank you, Lord God, for this evening. Thank you for your grace, Lord. As the psalmist said, Lord, from the rising of the sun to the setting of, of the same, the name of the Lord shall be praised. And Lord, we woke up this morning because of mercy, and we praised you and gave you thanks. And uh, as the, the evening winds down, Lord, and, and the sun sets, we thank you again and praise you for your great kindness and mercy toward us, Lord, that we uh, came through this day because of mercy and because of your great grace toward us. We pray, Lord God, that tonight we will have a time of fellowship in your word and in the truth, and that we'll be able to not only, Lord, speak of you with each other, but, Lord, but go out and speak to the world about you. And we thank you, Lord God, tonight. We will hear from your word, and by your Holy Spirit, we would sink this truth deep, deep in our hearts. And may it make a difference, Lord God, as it sinks into our spirit to change us and mold us into the image of your Son, Jesus. We ask these things in his great name, the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Psalm 114, Psalm 115. Why are they together? Besides that Psalm 114 is a very short psalm, they are usually sang together. And they're part of this portion of scripture called the Great Hallel, or the Hallel Rabbah, or in some circles they call it the Egyptian Hallel, meaning that they speak of the deliverance from Egypt into the Promised Land, and how God was so merciful to them. And the word Hallel, of course, means to praise, to praise. So 113 through Psalm 118, the Great Praise. And to praise the Lord is hallelujah, hallelujah, hallel, praise Yah, Yahweh, praise Yahweh. And so they were written and sung at the temple, and they were in connection with temple worship. If you have not read books by Mr. Alfred Edersheim, I do include, uh, encourage you to get them, various books. But one of them in particular is this one, the temple service, its ministry and its service Edersheim, of course, a, a Jewish believer, scholar, wrote wonderful books, including The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah. But this one in particular speaks of the great service that was done at the temple. And it speaks of the Hallel Rabbah, or the, uh, the Psalms of Hallel, the Psalms of Praise. And it describes how the priest will come out into the temple area, and he would say, Hallel, Hallel means to praise. And the people would shout, Hallelujah, hallelujah, praise Yahweh. And it was, this, it was very moving. If you, if you like reading Edersheim, he describes it so well. And so if you like that um, move and stirred with emotion, he, it definitely brings it out of how the people were so uh, in love with the praising of God, especially when they sang these three, or sorry, these six psalms, Psalm 113 through Psalm 118. And they were in connection with Passover, Actually, there were a connection with two other feasts, Pentecost and Tabernacles. But during Passover, they were sung. And this, of course, takes us back to the Gospels. At the coming of Jesus and at the coming of uh, the setting up of Palm Sunday, what we call Palm Sunday, it was the great feast. The Passover was coming up. And as Jesus is coming over the Mount of Olives into the Eastern Gate, They would have been singing Psalm 113 through Psalm 118. And of course, we read that in the Gospels that they, they were singing praise to the son of David, Hosanna, Hosanna to the son of David. They were praising the Lord for his Messiah to come. And uh, Jesus immediately reflects on it. And he says, this is the stone that the builders rejected because the Pharisees rejected. That's exactly what the Psalm says. Psalm 118 says, the stone that the builders rejected has become the full or the cornerstone. And so the Psalms are very deep into the life and ministry of Jesus. Of course, this is no different. This is no different. Psalm 113 through Psalm 118, of course, includes our two Psalms tonight. Psalm 114 and Psalm 115. They go together and you'll see it in a moment. But during Passover, they were sung a little bit different. It's the only feast that they were sung a little bit different, meaning that they normally would have sang all the psalms together, except on the night before Passover, you would sing 113 and 114. Then you would have a meal, and then you would come out of the meal and go back out into the 
uh, into the area, into Jerusalem, and praise God in Psalms 115 through 118. So you would read or sing the first two, 113, 114, eat a meal, get out of the meal, and go back out into the streets and praise the Lord again. So turn to Matthew 26, because this is something that our Lord Jesus actually did in a very real way. This is exactly what Matthew's referring to. Matthew 26, and look at verse 26. Matthew 26, 26, it says, while they were eating, this is the Passover meal. Jesus took some bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples. Take, eat, this is my body. And he then, he then took a cup and gave thanks, and he gave it to them, saying, drink, it, uh, drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for, the, uh, for many for forgiveness of sin. But I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now until that day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. After singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And that is exactly what the Hallel Rabbah was about. Jesus would, prob- would have sung 113, 114 prior to the meal, ate the meal, the new covenant would have been established or, or inaugurated, come out of the meal and gone out into the Mount of Olives and sang 115 through 118 with his disciples. What a great thing, isn't it? Because we would say right before the cross, this psalm would have been in the lips of our Lord. And it's a very powerful thing. Imagine reading the same thing Jesus was reading and singing the same thing Jesus was singing. Uh, it kind of brings you back to reality, doesn't it? A little bit grounds you down to, to our Lord to say, this is the Psalms of Jesus. So Jesus' last song or his last words before the cross were the Psalms that we're going to read tonight, specifically Psalm 115. Uh, let's turn to 118 right now, Psalm 118, uh, and just look at some of these things that Jesus would have said prior to his crucifixion, prior to his betrayal. Psalm 118, look at verse 17, and just, just read what it, would, uh, what it would sound like if you, were, if you knew that the cross was coming up. This would be kind of an interesting uh, song that they would have sang, especially in the, in the mind and the mouth of Jesus. Verse 17, I will not die, but I will live and tell of the works of the Lord. The Lord has disciplined me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Look at verse 22. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Jesus, knowing full well what was ahead, the kiss of Judas, the betrayal, the, uh, the trial at uh, Caiaphas and Annas' house, and eventually Rome, and eventually the trials in Rome, would have brought this all to fruition, the Hallel Rabbah. So we're reading very much holy ground, I guess we would say. We were stepping onto holy ground because it was written, if you go back to 114, uh, it was written at some point after the Exodus, of course, and Psalm 114 and 15, it speaks of the redemption, the redemption that God brought to Israel in a very powerful way. So Psalm 114 will describe God's power at the time of the Exodus and what he did to bring him out of it, bring all the Jews out, two and a half million, depending on uh, which historian you read, uh, one and a half to two and a half million Jews coming out of, his, out, out of Egypt into the, into the wilderness. And then Psalm 115, it's a response to Psalm 114 because now God is not operating the same way he did when he brought the children of Israel out of Egypt. He's been more quiet, and the heathen, the unbeliever, has come to the the Israelites, and they asked them, where is your God? Where is he at? Why Why isn't he doing anything? Why hasn't he revealed himself in the way that he did in Exodus. And so the psalmist responds in a very uh, beautiful way, kind of sarcastic in a few verses. And it's a prayer and it's a response uh, as an encouragement to God's people that even though God may not be as visible as it was in the Exodus, 
It does not mean God is not working. It doesn't mean God's not there. And it doesn't mean God doesn't care for us or love us. He is actually active in working things out, but he's fulfilling his purposes and allowing his invisible attributes, not only to display his glory, but he will come through. It says the psalmist, he will reveal himself in a very powerful way at the end. And we probably won't get to that tonight, but we'll get to that next week. This psalm has been an inspiration to a lot of wonderful believers. In fact, uh, uh, Adoniram Judson, which is one of them, probably the most famous missionaries, uh, he was, uh, he turned away from the Lord for a while. And if you read his uh, biography, as well as Hudson Taylor's biography, they really struggle with their faith. Before they became missionaries, they really struggle with their faith. So uh, it's an encouragement to I think a lot of us that maybe struggle with our faith and don't, you know, he had become sort of an agnostic into thinking, well, I can't prove God, I can't prove God. And his full ambition, it says, was to seek a great name for himself. He wanted to be a great businessman. He wanted to be great in the world. And he met this text, uh, Psalm 115 and Psalm, Psalm 114 and Psalm 115, and he fought against it, it says, and he realized that the words in his heart that God has put in there was the words for Psalm 115, verse 1. Not unto us, not unto us, but unto your name, give glory. And he turned back from where he was and he went back into the mission field. And he probably became one of the greatest missionaries that God has ever used in that field. And of course, Isaac Watts, a great hymn writer, read Psalm 114 and he says, I want to make a song out of it. And he couldn't do a song. He struggled with it. And he couldn't do a good, he didn't do a good job. So he scrapped the first one and he came back in the second one. He said, I just can't understand. I just don't see God in Psalm 114. And he kept reading it and reading until he realized that God is the one that kept, uh, that kept bringing Israel back from a very difficult circumstances and display his wonderful, powerful work. And so he was able to write Psalm 114. It's one of most, uh, his, one of his famous hymns. Isaac Watts, and of course, I think everybody knows the other hymn that he wrote, right? Anybody know the other hymn? Probably the most, um, most popular, no, that was Newton. That was the most popular, most, you sing it every Christmas, but it wasn't a Christmas song. It was originally not a Christmas song, but we sing it during Christmas. What's that? Say it. Joy to the world, that's it. So Isaac Watts, joy to the world as he was reading the Psalms that Jesus was coming, and that's what he wrote. It became the, first, you know, it became the Christmas song, Probably the most famous Christmas song of all time. So let's read Psalm 114. It's only a few verses to see how far we can get into Psalm 115. I want to get into Psalm 115, but remember, they're sang together. So the only time they were not sang together was at Passover. At Passover, you would eat a meal in between the two Psalms. We don't have dinner tonight, although that would have been appropriate. Uh, maybe we'll do that next year. If God gives us that grace, we'll... We'll come together, we'll read all the Psalms, Psalm 113 through Psalm 118, we'll have a meal, and then we'll come back and sing Psalm 115 through Psalm 118. And we'll talk to Christian about that. That sounds a lot of fun. Uh, Psalm 114, when Israel went forth from Egypt, the house of Jacob from a people of strange language, Judah became his sanctuary, Israel became his dominion. When Israel came out, of, as, uh, came out from Egypt, what were they like? Well, when you read the book of Exodus, they were just a bunch of slaves. That's all they were. A bunch of slaves, a bunch of people that had been downtrodden for many, many years, 400 years in Egypt, not very prosperous, not very good. They just were beaten down for so long, but God had mercy on them. He'd remember them, and he sent Moses to deliver them, and God brought them out. And it says that they came out from a people of strange language. Now, the word stranger, if you look it up, it's a fabulous word. It simply means a coarse or difficult or sort of a barbaric, violent language. It doesn't mean strange like it was weird. It, it, it meant more a very violent language, meaning the Egyptians were so hard against the Jewish people, against the Israelites. The taskmaster uh, beating down on them, not just physically, but with words, the reproach and cruelty that Egypt had toward God's people was evident. I think nothing must change today. I think the world's still very cruel and very harsh toward the people of God in that sense. Very violent language, and yet God delivered them. It says in verse 2, Judah became a sanctuary, 
and Israel became his dominion. The people of God were quite an interesting people. They were the only people at the time had no king. They had no king, and they were coming out of Egypt into the wilderness with absolutely no kingdom, earthly one, no earthly kingdom. They simply were a people with a prophet named Moses and a God and a king who could not be seen. That's pretty strange. And they wandered through the wilderness, and the people thought, all the nations around them, what a bunch of weirdos. They have no king, no visible king, no land, no visible uh, leader. Uh, they got this guy named Moses, and he's got a staff, but there's no king. There's no, they got a box, you know, that, that, that always leads them. And it was just a strange thing. But look how God describes them. He says, Judah became his sanctuary. Now, when you think of a sanctuary, what do you think? A church, right? A people, what's that? A cathedral. A place of worship, right? A hiding place. Now, who was that? Uh, it says, who was God's sanctuary? This Judah was. Meaning that God took a bunch of slaves, a bunch of people that didn't really matter to Egypt or to the world, and he made them to be his people, his faithful people. And actually, God dwelled among them. Just like it says in the New Testament that Jesus came to his own people and dwell with them. It's the same idea that in the wilderness, God took a shrine and it was his people and he dwelled with them. He dwelled with them. And so there were holy people that God set them apart and they were very, very different. They're very different than the rest of the world. And therefore the world mocked them and looked at them as, and with derision. But God did not look at them that way. God actually says, these are my people and I love them, and I am going to make them a sanctuary. Now, for God to say he'll make them a sanctuary, it literally means that God will actually not only make them holy, but he'll make them something that he would like to dwell with them. Turn to Leviticus 11. Leviticus 11 has an interesting view. of from, This is from God's perspective of what he thinks of his people, what he wants his people to become. And verse 44, so 11, 44, 1, 1, 4, 4. Should be easy to remember. Leviticus 11.44 says, For I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am holy, and you shall not make yourselves unclean with any of the swarming things that swarm on the earth. For I am the Lord your God who brought you from the land of Egypt to be your God. Thus you shall be holy, for I am holy. This is quoted in the New Testament by Peter, uh, calling uh, the believer, the church, Gentile and Jewish believer together as God's people, God's dwelling place. Well, before there was the church, there was Israel. And God says, back to Psalm 114, they were his sanctuary. They were his place of worship. God dwelled among them and they didn't have a king. However, he says Israel was his dominion. Verse 2, Israel was his dominion. So how can a bunch of slaves that had no no relationship to God up to this point. They've forgotten 400 years. So that means that generation after generation, they remember Abraham, but it had been a long time since God actually had done anything in them. And God says, now you're going to be my people. You're going to be my sanctuary and you're going to be my dominion, meaning that I'm going to rule over you. And they had no king but God. The only true theocracy in the world was the children of Israel at that time. And uh, they were unarmed, they didn't have any weapons, and yet they were out to go out into the wilderness and they were going to be attacked and they were going to be persecuted by the nations around them. And God says, you're going to be my sanctuary and I'm going to have you as my, in my dominion. I'm going to rule over you. The true kingdom of God on the earth with just a bunch of nobodies in the middle of a hot desert wandering around with no real home to call their own. Now, I don't know, in, in the world's perspective, that would have been a bunch of losers. That would have been just someone that you really put in, no stock into them, except one major difference. God made all the difference. With God in the midst of them, they were absolutely invincible, and they were absolutely holy and absolutely under his kingdom. It says in verse 3, now look how the psalmist is painting this picture. And you got to see this picture the way the psalmist is talking because he's reaching back with vivid pictures. 
So think about this. It's, it's poetic, but it's powerful. He's going to reach back into your mind and look back at Exodus and say, look what God did. Because when he brought us out, the sea looked and, they, and it fled. The Jordan turned back. The mountains skipped like rams, the hills like lambs. What ails you, O sea, that you have to flee or that you flee? O Jordan, that you turn back. O mountains, that you skip like rams. O hills, like lambs. So the first thing he goes back to is probably the most amazing event at the beginning of the Exodus, right? He had delivered them with a mighty hand, the 10 plagues. The, the, the firstborn was killed, Pharaoh's son. Uh, the blood of the lamb was put on the door. And as they come out and into the Red Sea, they, they, they head toward the Red Sea and they hit a dead stop. And here comes Pharaoh's armies. And God delivers them by parting the Red Sea. So the Red Sea is the big miracle at this time. And the way the, the psalmist quotes it is, the sea looked and it fled. Like, look at the language that he uses. It's, 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 it's funny, uh, hu humorous per se, but it's also referring to why did the Red Sea flee? <laughs> yeah, why did, they, why, did it, why did it flee? Did it see a bunch of farmers coming through and it just said, get out of the way? He saw the sea, the creation saw the creator, and it just fled. And it said it fled in such a way that it literally ran away in terror is the word that is used there. It's an imagery that you have to like sit back and just enjoy it because it's like, imagine the sea just standing up and fleeing apart from each other because God is about to come through that area. And it's a wonderful thing because it's like creation understands the power of God. The creator was in the midst of it. Now turn to Luke 4, because it's quite interesting that the same creator, Luke 4, 29, the same creator was on the earth, Jesus. And something unique happened to the life of Jesus in many occasions, but this one in particular is quite interesting. When he was in Nazareth, when he was in Nazareth, this is the beginning of his ministry. Uh, in chapter 4, in verse 14, uh, when Jesus returned to Galilee, in the power of the Spirit, this is, of course, after the temptation, news about him spread through all the surrounding districts and began teaching in the synagogues. And he was praised by all. And he came to Nazareth, his hometown, and had been brought up, he'd been brought up there as it was his custom. He entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and he stood up and read. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. And he opened the book and found the place where it was written, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor sent me to proclaim uh, release to the captives and recovery to the sight of the blind to free those who are oppressed. Now he stops there, a whole different study, but this is from Isaiah 61. That's, he didn't quote the whole chapter. He didn't quote the, uh, the whole entire uh, verse, I should say. There's a, another part of the verse that deals with the day of the Lord, but Jesus stops at that moment and doesn't quote it. And you always have to ask yourself, not only why did Jesus quote it, but why didn't he quote the whole verse? Well, of course, it's because he brought salvation. He brought the first part of the verse in his first coming. The second half of that verse in, Psalm, in Isaiah 61 will be fulfilled at his second coming. And that is the day of the Lord. A whole other study for another time. But there are, like, there are many scriptures like that where the New Testament only quotes half of it. And you wonder, why didn't they quote the whole thing? Uh, Zechariah 12 is another one like that. They looked upon him who they had pierced. That's quoted at the cross. But if you read Zechariah 12, it actually keeps going. And it says, but they mourn for him like one mourns for his only son. And they're like, why didn't John quote it? Well, it's because that other half of the verse is found in Revelation, the book of Revelation. That second half of the verse will be fulfilled at his second coming. They're like that. Many, many verses like that. Another study for another time. But Jesus is now proclaiming this is the Messiah. He says to proclaim the very favorable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and he gave it back to the attendant and sat down and the, all, and, and the eyes of all in the synagogues were fixed on him. And he began to say, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your ears or in your hearing. Basically claiming he is the Messiah. There's no doubt about it. The spirit of the Lord was upon me. He is anointed. The Mashiach was here. The Messiah was there. And everybody looked around and said, no way. This dude is not the Messiah. And it, was, it would have been about as strange as a day laborer coming into a church today and just proclaiming he's a Messiah. It would have been like, who is this guy? But yet he was the Messiah as the scriptures will fulfill. 
But nobody believed him because everybody knew he was from Nazareth. Everybody knew this was Mary's son, Joseph's son. How can it be him? Verse 22, and all were speaking well of him and wonder at the very gracious words which were falling on his lips. And they were saying, is this, this not Joseph's son? And he said to them, no doubt you will quote this proverb to me, physician, heal yourself. Whatever we heard has been done in Capernaum, do here in your hometown. Now, this is a whole aspect about no prophet will be welcome in his hometown. Uh, Capernaum, Nazareth, all these places had seen the, the power of Jesus, but they didn't believe in him. That's what there was a judgment on Capernaum, uh, but Saida, because they did not believe in the works that the Lord had done. Um, again, another, another study for another time. However, they were so angry with them. I'm going to jump down to verse 29. Jump down to verse 29. They were so angry with them because he had proclaimed that he had come to Israel, but he also had come to preach to everybody, even the Gentiles. That's what he quotes about the widow at the time of Elijah. And it says in verse 29, they got up and they drove him out of the city. Can you imagine that? People's hearts so hardened against God that the Messiah would come to your hometown and you drove him out. But this was the state of the heart of Israel. And it says, and he led them through uh, 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 and led him to brow of the hill, which was uh, their city, which was been built in order to throw him off a cliff. And you go to that, what they believe the cliff would have been. Some people believe it should have been there. Um, you can go there. And there's, there's good evidence that it's probably close by where it was. But it says that they drove him off a cliff. But passing through their midst, he went on his way. Now, how did Jesus get through that crowd? Now, I, I'm not trying to make dogmatic about it. But I think it's very similar to what happened at the Red Sea. I think Jesus walked right through the midst of it. Some manifestation of his glory and power was evident there that the people couldn't touch him. The people just parted ways, and Jesus was walked right through the midst of it, unharmed, untouched. Why? Because he was God. Because nature itself knows the power of God, and he passed through the midst of it, even though they wanted to kill him, and they wanted to destroy him, throw him off a cliff. He parted the way, and there was some kind of manifestation of his glory, I believe, at that moment in time, and he just like the Red Sea parted, the people parted, and Jesus walked right through the midst of it. Let's go back to Psalm 114. Because he's not done. The psalmist is going to continue to explain something that we maybe as Christians don't think about too much, but it's at the very heart of Israel. The Jordan turned back. Now, where is this found? The Jordan turned back. Forty years later, if you know the story of Israel, 40 years later, another miracle happened. So you have the first miracle of the, jo the Red Sea parting, 40 years in between. And then at the end of that 40 years, another miracle. And this one is the Jordan. And it says that the Jordan, the great river, it said it fled. It turned back. It actually turned back. And so the first event, the parting of the sea. Second event, the parting of the Jordan. And one leads them out of slavery and the other one opens the door into the promised land. Remember, this is the second generation. They're about to go into the promised land, but God has to open the door again. Freedom, rejoicing. There's a promised land ahead, and God has these two amazing bookends of um, miracles, one at the beginning, one at the end. Now, what were the differences? Now, this is quite unique about this because if you read the story, it's in the book of Joshua, it's quite unique that it was different. It was way different. For one, Moses had to stand there with his staff. And then a great wind came at the Red Sea, and it parted everything. You see none of that in the story of the Jordan. By the way, the Jordan would have been at his maximum capacity. And he says that in the text, that it was at, at his fullness. So uh, during his fullness, it's about a mile or two, depending on how you measure it, uh, between the, uh, between the, the, the banks. So uh, that's a mile long to two miles long that you have to cross. So it's no real, you know, no small river. It's quite a bit. The second thing is there was no rod, there was no wind, there was no elements to it. Uh, it was just simply they had to trust God. But what did God tell them? Not everybody at once. The Ark of the Covenant with the priest had to go first. And he sends them out. And it actually says that the priest got into the water. So it didn't part right away. 
they got into the water, and as they were walking into the water, then the water began to recede. And so it speaks of obedience. They had to obey God's word. They couldn't just see it and then do it. They had to do it. Then they would see it. After 40 years, you'd think that they would have a little more faith in God, wouldn't they? You know, they would trust him more. And that's what God was drawing from them. Because, uh, by the way, nobody was allowed for about a half a mile. So everybody had to stand back for about a half a mile in between them and the Ark of the Covenant. Now, what does that speak to you about? God says, okay, part the ways. Everybody stand back. Just let my ark go first. Priests, you have to get in there. And nobody can do anything until the priests get in there, right? And so that speaks that God wanted to demonstrate his power to them uh, by allowing the priest, the people that knew the Lord the most, that would be the closest to God, by going in and trusting God for that miracle. And it was a pretty amazing thing because two million people at the banks waiting half a mile away between them and the ark. No one was allowed to get in. And God is just doing something amazing, powerful. And um, parted the Jordan. Boom. And remember, as, they, as the Jordan stands up, right, the water stand up, people, it probably would have been about 30 miles between one set of water to the other. I mean, just imagine. Amazing. And people had to go through. One and a half million people had to go through. Two, and a, two million people had to go through this, this, this dry area now. And as they're going through, they're looking at these stones. And Joshua says, you know what? I don't want anybody to forget this. I don't want anybody to forget what God has done. And he gets a bunch of stones, 12 of them, and he sets them up, up a memorial, one for each tribe of Israel that nobody will remember. In fact, at the time of Joshua, they were still there. Even at the end of the book of Joshua, they were still there. Um, the psalmist is recording what God has done. He's showing his power, showing his might. But then it goes on because he's not done yet. He says, the mountains skip like rams, the hills like lambs. In between these two miracles, what was Israel doing? Between the Red Sea and the Jordan, what were they doing? They went to Mount Sinai right away, right? That was an amazing sight because it says Mount Sinai was on fire. And again, this is very poetic, but you could see the psalmist trying to interweave the power of God in a real, in a real way is that the mountains skip like rams. And uh, this is Mount Sinai, at least a, a rendition of it. And the hills all through that area knew that God was in the midst of the Jewish people. Now, what can the mountains do? Well, it says they skip like rams. They skip like little lambs. They were nothing to the power of God. Now, in biblical imagery, the mountains are this incredible force, immovable. Things that you look up and you're like, how are we ever going to move this? And that's what Jesus used that metaphor, right? If you have faith, you can move mountains. You can trust God that even the impossible he could do in a very real way. And this is what was happening all around the hills of the desert in that wilderness, the mountains, these immovable forces of, uh, in the world, things that you go, I will never overcome. This is impossible. What are you up against? You know, we're up against Rome. We're up against Egypt. We're up against these incredible, powerful kingdoms. And Jesus said, if you trust the Lord, if you trust in him, you can overcome. Of course, these mountains in the book of Revelation, it says they will be moved. Every island will be moved. Every mountain will be shaken. Why? Because the Lord is coming. The Lord is coming. It'll happen again. This is a preview of the book of Revelation as the Lord is coming down from heaven to earth and nature will know it. This is why creation groans, Paul says, because they know something is coming. They know something is coming the revelation of the sons of God. Jesus is about to come. And when that happens, the earth will be in upheaval. But that's a different, start, uh, different study. Why are the mountains reacting this way? Because God was among his people, right in the midst of it. And so it's, 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 it's funny how it's rendered. Oh, Jordan, what happened to you? Oh, see, what, why did you flee back? I guess a, a, a better way of saying, or a, a modern way of saying it's what's up with you? What happened to you? What happened? Well, you know, what is up with you? Why did you flee back, Red Sea? Why did you flee back, Jordan? What happens to you, mountains? Well, the Lord was upon them. Now, take a look at what had happened in those areas. Because those areas had been traveled by very powerful leaders. 
Pharaoh had been around these, the Red Sea. And then the Red Sea flew back. It never did that when Pharaoh was around. Only when God was around. What happened to those mountains? Well, in those mountains, there was the king, uh, King Og of Bashan. King Og uh, was a very powerful ruler at the time. If you, if you read the story in Exodus, uh, his bed was huge. It was, it was a giant. And he'd been around those areas. And those mountains didn't do anything when he was around. And of course, those giants that dwell in the promised land, remember the, the, uh, the Caleb and Joshua said, there's, you know, there's giants, but God's going to be with us. So he's, gonna, he's bigger than those giants. And they roamed around the banks of the Jordan. And the Jordan didn't do anything when they were around, only when God was around. Then they began to see and they began to notice creation itself knew the power of God. And it says in verse 7, They tremble, tremble, O earth, before the Lord, before the God of Jacob, who turned the rock into a pool of water, the flint into a mountain of water. The power of God, the presence of God within his people was so, it was the awareness of creation that God was among his people. And he was so powerful, he gave them water. He gave them water out of a rock. All through the wilderness, we have this amazing story, and it even ends in a, in, in, in a tragic end for Moses, because he didn't do what the Lord said to do. Uh, he, struck the, he, he was to strike the rock once and speak to the rock the second time. But the fact of the matter is, God brought floods of water, living water, uh, from the rock. And the rock was Christ, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, that Jesus gave, God gave the water to the children of Israel, but it was the power of God. He can do the impossible. Even rocks can. God can even bring water out of the rock and the flints that gushed out into fountains. And this is what they're saying here, the flint into a fountain of water. Oh, God must be really powerful. God must be really amazing. Now that's Psalm 114. Didn't take too long of that. Because now you can think, okay, why is Psalm 115 follows, what does it follow? Why does it follow 114? And we just have to turn to there and look at verse 1. Not unto us, Lord. Not unto us. Repeat it for effect, but to emphasize the point. But to your name give glory because of your loving kindness, because of your truth. So we've been thinking about God and how amazing he was. He did all these work in the time of Exodus. He brought us out of Egypt. He took us through took us the wilderness, and God did it. He's the one that brought us out. He fed us. He took care of us. Fire by night, cloud by day, fed us, watered us, right? The manna, the water. He took all the enemies. Even, even King Og of Bashan was not not even, not even a, 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 a foe against God. The Jordan, the Red Sea. It was all gone. It was all God. He did it. And the history of Israel has no folk heroes. You know, folk heroes meaning that, oh, you know, like we have George Washington and, you know, the fight and, you know, Concord and Lexington and all this stuff. We have, we have folk heroes. You know, you know what the folk stories are about uh, Israel? God. He did it. He parted the Red Sea. I mean, you tell your, ch your children, you know, we serve a God that's so powerful. He parted the Red Sea. I mean, Washington... You know, he, he went through the Delaware, the river. You know, he, he traveled through the Delaware River, but God parted the Red Sea. God is able to do that. So there's no folk story in the history of Israel. It's all God, and nobody can take credit for it, and that's why Psalm 115 begins like this. Not unto us, Lord, not unto us, but unto your name give glory because of your loving kindness. That's the word hesed there, faithfulness. Because of your faithfulness, God, because of your truth, because of your truth, and explains why the psalmist continues. God brought salvation to the children of Israel, the great terror of God. He brought fear to all the land in which the children of Israel were traveling through the wilderness. All the kings and all the nations were afraid of a bunch of peasants with a box, if you're going to put it in just terms like that, right? A bunch of peasants with no king and no weapons in a box leading them through the wilderness. And there was no visible king. And all they said, all they said was God was, and he was invisible. But he was not, he was invisible, but he was working. And you could see it. And this is the difference, right, between the gods of the world 
that want to be seen. They're materialistic. You need to notice them. You need to figure out who they are. But God doesn't need that. God is invisible, but he operates within the work, within mankind. And so that's what the psalmist says. All the things God did, all the rock that he crushed, all the people that he overcame, the psalmist is going to ask now a very important question. Verse 2. Why did the nation say, now, where is their God? Something has happened. Children of Israel got into the promised land. God delivered them. God brought them in. Then the children of Israel were unfaithful, and they were taken to exile. And during the exile, you know what the nations said? Aren't you the people of God? Aren't you, the, you know, God, isn't God going to deliver you? Where is your God? We don't see him working anymore. He must be gone. He's not with you anymore. And the children of Israel had to deal with this question. Why isn't God working like he used to? Why isn't he operating the same powerful way that we saw in Psalm 114? I mean, he could do it. And then the psalmist will begin to explain. And we'll, we'll finish it next week, but we'll, we'll, at least we'll get into it today. Praise God. Because it is written to three different kinds of audiences. Three different kinds of audiences. Uh, look at verse 9 real quick. Well, sorry, verse, yeah, verse 9 and 10. These are the audience that he's speaking to. O Israel, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. O house of Aaron, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. You who fear the Lord, trust the Lord. He is their help and their shield. Three different people. Why? Well, of course, the house of Israel is, of course, uh, God's people that he brought out of Egypt. There were all the Jewish people that were brought out of Egypt. Uh, the house of Aaron, who's that? The priest. Now, what were the priests known for? Sacrifices, but um, yeah, they performed them. But there were the special people within Israel that were consecrated to God, right? They were the consecrated ones. Uh, all, they were all children of Israel. There was no doubt about it. All house of Israel. But there was a specific group that were just like committed to God. They were the group that had no land. They had no home. They simply had the reward being God. And they had 70 cities of, of mercy uh, in which they can live. But they lived in the temple. They lived in sacrifices. Uh, they performed the sacrifices. They were the ones who said, our life is to serve God. That's what they were there for. And there were reminders. And of course, all those who fear the Lord. Who's that? Everyone, right? Anybody, Jew and Gentile, whoever fears the Lord, this is for you. So the psalmist is getting their attention. Anybody from the house of Israel, anybody that's a priest, and anybody that fears the Lord, this is for us. Because it's going to be a very, very important question. It's a psalm of praise, and, and I'm just going to... Uh, this is an outline, very quickly, an outline, because Psalm 115, we're going to have to do it next week because it will take another hour to do it. The verse 1 is very simple. It's to give God glory, simply to give God glory. The second half, or the second part, is there's a crisis. Like any of God's people, there's always a crisis. What is this crisis? The nations, the heathen, the unbeliever are standing by and saying, we don't see your God. We have our own gods. Uh, they're the idols. They're our own gods. And we could see them. And they do some good to us. Where's your God? What has he done to you? What has he done for you? Yeah, you speak of all the wonderful things he did in the past, but what is he doing now? It's a challenge. It's a challenge to God's people at that time. It's a challenge to God's people today. Because you know what? The world would say to us Christians, we have something better. We have it over you. Your God doesn't, he's not visible. You claim to worship God, you lift up your hands, but he's not visible. In fact, he seems very quiet. You, you claim Jesus is king, but actually we've got a bunch of governors that think they're, they're, their little Jesus is running around. You know, we got a bunch of people in the European Union who think they're God. See, our gods, our government, our nations, we're powerful. What about your God? Doesn't even have a nation. Doesn't even have a land. And even the Jews who claim to be God's people, they don't even believe in him anymore. So where is your God? And you know what? This is a very challenging thing because I've been asked this even from as a young Christian. 
and even by other Christians. I just don't see how God's going to work. I just don't see how God's going to operate this. I just don't see how God's going to do it. Well, he's going to do it. And that's the crisis. And we're going to see his reply because his reply is very powerful because this, this idea of the nations calling out God's people, he's going to give an answer. And that answer is, you guys have idols. And your idols, guess who made them? You. We are created by God in his image. You created the idols in your image, which leads to a very, very important thing. Why does man create idols? And it's at the heart of this psalm, and it's at the heart of why we're going to do it. Um, it's because God, man still wants to be God. It wants to create something. It wants to be in control. Man wants to create and be in control, just like who? Just like God. But it was the certain serpent's lie, right? Exactly. Now look at this psalm. Look in the verse, uh, verse 16. We're going to uh, have to get through it next week. But look at the Psalm 16, or verse 16 of Psalm 115. The heavens are the heavens of the Lord, but the earth he has given to the sons of men. God versus man. This is what the psalm will become. It's a follow-up song. Now, it was, in, it was in the lips of Jesus, this psalm, so you can imagine as Jesus is singing the psalm, and he's God, but he also has become a man, and he's the redeemer of the world, and he's fighting against idolatry in the heart, even in the heart of God's people. Because ultimately, there are two great sins that man has committed. Two great ones that encompass a lot of them, but two great ones. It's one of them is man tries to be God. Man tries to be God. And as Anthony was talking about is from the beginning, eat the fruit, become like God. That's the devil's answer to that question. The woman saw that it was good. She said that it was pleasing and she thought it will make you wise. I have fill, you know, all the check boxes were checked off. It looked good. It looked like it make you wise. It was pleasing to the eye. It was pleasant. And he said, ooh, this is nice. And the lie was, if once you eat it, you will become like God, knowing good from evil. Did that really happen? Well, the story of Adam and Eve didn't stop there, right? But both ate it, and God and man became separated. But you see it later on, that man began to think like they could be gods. This is the, this is the, the, the beginning of that lie that is ballooned into what we see today. When man tries to be God, when did man try to be God right away? We got to go back to Babylon. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 11. We'll park here for a little bit, and then we'll pick it up next week. Genesis chapter 11, verse 2. When man tried to be God, it didn't happen right away, but it began. The seeds were already sown, but it was full-blown. Now, at the time of Noah, of course, it was at the same time uh, earlier in chapter 6. They had become sinful and they had become violent against God and his spirit. Now the whole earth used the same language and the same words. Chapter 11. And it came about as they journeyed east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they settled there. This is the plains of Babylon. Eventually became the plains of Babylon. Actually the word Babel, gate or to confuse, which has the same kind of idea. Babel, we have the use of the word Babel, right? You know, you're babbling uh, has the same kind of root. It's a very difficult word to translate. It's either gate or to confuse, like you're babbling. Well, it could, be the, it could be both. Like many times in Semitic languages, meanings have deeper, one shallow meaning and a deeper meaning. It's the gate of confusion. What's the confusion? God is God, and there's only one God. Why can God be the, why can God be the only true God? Why, why is there only one God? Why is the qualification from being God? Well, I mean, put it another way. Let me rephrase it. What's the qualification for being God? Creator? What else? Holy, eternal, right? What else? Think of the attributes of God. He's the only one that can be God, by the way. If I try to be God, I am, what's that? Omnipotent, powerful, loving, truthful, just, righteous, he could see anything, do anything, know everything, right? He's perfect qualities to be God. 
Nobody is, is like him. There's nobody like him. So if man tries to become God, it'll, he'll fail. Why? Because man is unjust. He's unrighteous. He is not holy. He's selfish, very self-centered. These are our best attributes, right? These are the best things we could offer. And so man tries to be God, and guess what's going to happen? They're going to turn into one of these governors that we have around here, right? Because they are unqualified to be God. They're unqualified to rule anything because it's going to turn into oppression. Why? Because as man becomes self-centered and selfish, they would try to control and rule other people. That's just the way it is. But God can rule. Why? Because God is fair. God is loving. God is, he's the only one that can be just and loving and fair all at the same time. Now, verse 3. They said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they used brick for stone, and they used tar for mortar. Now, bricks later on will be in the book of Exodus. It was to build another kingdom of men. They said, come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose stops will reach into the heavens and let us make for ourselves a name. Otherwise, we'll be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. Let us make ourselves a name. We want to be known. We want to have a brand. We want to be a real powerful people together. Right? Let us come, let us build together a city. This is the first time uh, the word city is mentioned in the Bible, meaning that um, when you see cities being built, it's something that man tries to contrive, try to do. And cities usually have, now, in and of itself, there's nothing wrong with cities. But the idea of cities is man coming together and building now, what happens when you get a bunch of sinners together? Not good, right? <laughs> right? Not good. Now, God put them in a garden. Man wanted to build a city. You see the difference between garden and a city? God does have a city. His city is Jerusalem. And from this point on, it's the battle of two cities, the holy city of Jerusalem and Babylon. And you can go all the way to the book of Revelation. Guess what you'll find? Jerusalem and Babylon. And depending on where you are, depending on where you stand with God, right? The heavenly Jerusalem, Mount Zion, or you got Babylon who will be overthrown and destroyed. Now, we'll get to that next week, I promise. But right now, we have to settle the, establish the foundation. Verse 5, And it came down, the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. The Lord said, Behold, they're not, they are one people, and they have the same language. And this is what they began to do. And, no, and now, nothing which they purpose to do will be impossible for them. They began to use all the current, uh, I, I wouldn't say the word technology, but things that they could use at that time, what was available to them. And language was one that they tried to use and leverage to build for themselves a great city and a great name. All the glory does not belong to God at this point. All the glory is going to be for men. And this is why the Tower of Babel became, the significant of the Tower of Babel is man will try to become God. That's why they built it all the way up to the tower, uh, up to the heavens. Uh, they found all these uh, buildings in, in that area, archaeologically. Uh, they didn't look like that, although that's a better picture. But they were called ziggurats. They're called ziggurats. And uh, what they found, that these ziggurats, what we call Tower of Babel in the Bible, were temples of worship. And they try to build them as high as they can to go up to the heavens. And uh, there's all kinds of Jewish legends and things like that that are really, really interesting on how they were built and how man didn't care for other men that were building it. In fact, uh, there's a Jewish uh, story. Now, this is a Jewish story. I don't know if it's true, but it kind of gives you the insight. A lot of these stories are to give you the insight of how people thought in uh, Babel. So when they were building the city of Babel, or the Tower of Babel, according to Jewish legends, it was, they were supposed to um, take bricks all the way up to the top, all the way up to the top. And it took almost a year to go from the very bottom all the way up to the top. That's how, how tall it was. Now, some embellishment there, I don't know, but it was really tall. If a lady that was working on the tower uh, on the Tower of Babel, uh, if she had a baby, it was, it, was, it, was a, it, was, it was just like, you need to just keep working. 
And if the baby fell from way up to the top, nobody blinked an eye. Just keep working. Because everybody had to work on the top of the buildings. You had to be way up there. And if the lady had a baby and the baby fell, nobody cared. Moved on. But if some slave up there dropped a brick and it went all the way down to the floor, people just stopped and they screamed and they, they, they howl and complain how terrible it was for one brick to be lost. And the story, the theme of the story in this Jewish tale is man had become so cruel toward other men and their building that they didn't care for each other. They didn't care for babies anymore. All they care about was to build their city. Now, whether or not it's true, that story, it does bring the point that we see today. Men are trying to build their cities and their uh, kingdom do not care for each other, let alone babies. They only care for the bottom line. Oh, a break fell. Oh, the quarterly earnings. <laughs> oh, the profit and loss. You know, they just aborted a bunch of babies this week. Ah, oh, you know, a profit and loss statement is in the red. We need to make sure that it's up again next week. Otherwise, you're fired. You know, that kind of thing. So it began there. It began to really understand that, that God was not visible in their mind, was not visible in their eyes anymore. And that became the big problem. The big problem was God was removed out of that place and man tried to become God. Now, what's interesting about this is we have a very similar thing in our world today. And it's grown by the issues of technocracy. Technocracy is just a fancy way of saying technology will become our, will, will rule through technology. Will rule through technology. And it's been coming on and on for a long time. Man has always, from the Tower of Babel until now, has developed technology in order to, in some cases, for the betterment of humanity, but like any man that would want to be something good, somebody can take it and build something bad and use it for bad. And technocracy and technology has done exactly the same thing. Billions and billions of dollars spent every year, and this is, uh, even happened today. They didn't launch, though. To explorations, into new horizons, new technology. SpaceX, I don't think they launched the weather issues, with NASA, Elon Musk's thing. And they were going to launch this thing into space because we been, haven't been into space for a long time. I haven't been to the heavens in a long, long time. And they were going to do it because we need to get up there again. Even though NASA has said numerous times, by the way, that you know, between the billions of dollars that they spent and what they find out about it, uh, about space and, and what they, what, what's going on up there, is it doesn't really offset the cause. Like, it's almost, it's a losing battle. <laughs> It says, what we've found by sending humans to the moon or space or anything like that doesn't even cover anything versus the cost that we have, billions and billions of dollars. So why does man have this desire to go to the moon, to go to space? What is it? Yeah, in a lot of ways, you saw the Tower of Babel. Let us build. Now, we've gone up pretty high on buildings now. What's the next level? Space. Explorations. Now it says in verse 16, the heavens are the heavens of the Lord, but the earth he's given to the sons of men. In a lot of ways, a lot of interesting ways, um, I don't think God ever intended for us to go up there. Whose idea was it to get up? What was the purpose of it? In fact, NASA has even said, you know, we could have done a lot of these things without sending men up to space. We could have just sent, uh, um, what do they call those, uh, satellites. We could have just sent satellites and uh, uh, rovers up to space. It would have been perfectly fine. There was no need to send any more humans up there. Now, this is going to continue on because you know what? Uh, even uh, co-founder, well, actually, he is the founder of Virgin Atlantic, Richard Bronson. He, has, uh, he wants to take people into... Space exploration, meaning that for a couple million dollars, you can go into space and take a tour. It's called Virgin Atlantic. And he'll take you around to the moon, and that's his next thing. His next mission is, that, is to take people to, just for fun, just go to the moon for the weekend and then come back. And although there's no benefit to it except for him, millions and millions of dollars, but there's this race, SpaceX. Uh, um, Virgin Galactic, uh, Jeff Bezos wants to have a, uh, uh, a colony up there. 
He wants to have a space station, a space colony, where people can go to the weekend. Now, all this stuff, you could say, no, they'll never get there. And that's not my point. My point is the drive, the sense of we need to get up there. In fact, now it's not just the US and Russia like it was in the 60s and 70s. Now it's Japan, China, newest kid on the block, India. We're all sending things to the moon and to Mars because we need to conquer space. We need to get up there. So what's, what's really the point? What's really behind it all? The yeah, the final frontier, yeah. All the stories about Star Wars and Star uh, Trek is going to come to pass, right? But the idea is man wants to conquer space. Now, the heavens of heavens are the Lord's, it says. The earth is given to man. God has given authority to man in this, this, this space that we have here, this, this earth. Now, what about when you get into other things, right? Um, so this idea of spirit, it's, it's, it's really spiritual at the heart of the matter. Why does man take pride and joy in their technology so much so that they want to take it to the next level and the next level? And it doesn't matter how much billions of dollars it cost because there's just more money. We just print it. There's just not enough money for something else, right? But um, because man wants to get up there, wants to challenge the very aspect of God. Well, what about this one? What about when man gets so involved into technology, it wants to make something that is reflective of man, man's image and likeness on the earth with AI technology. The AI technology, genetic makeup of humanity, uh, or artificial intelligence, right? It's, it's all man-made. It's all man's technology. It's amazing. They have AI technology. It's pretty amazing now. It's, it's not just learning or, or like a GPS on your map that kind of tells you where to go and things like that. It's now developing curiosity. They've developed AI technology that wants to learn. It, it's curious. Why do you humans behave like this? Why do you act like that? What is love? What is this? And what is that? It's developing something that they never thought possible. Curiosity. Not just input, output, but wants to know why. And they quickly are kind of getting excited, but at the same time kind of scared because AI technology is going, well, where's this going? What's the end result? Are, are the exit ramps, when you're developing AI technology now, the, meaning exit ramps, do they, do they know when to shut it off? Or do they just continue on pushing it to the next level? It's a big problem. Because it's even gotten into human genetics, developing the next set of humans, CRISPR technology. Huge, 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 huge. Not just, this is one little company, big ones, designer babies. We could have a baby that has all these great qualities. Right? Yeah, in a very real way. I, you know, high IQ, certain color eyes, low risk of Alzheimer's, cancer, all this stuff. Uh, we can just have superhumans on the earth. Now, this is no... You say, this is, this is fantasy, but it's not real fantasy. It's, they really are big companies doing this, and they developed technology to actually override the place of God, meaning that if God created us like this, we can override that and create them. And as Time Magazine had put out for a while, um, immortality is the real end. Immortality is the end goal, meaning that you won't certainly die. You can go on forever. What was, that? what was Satan saying to the man and the woman? Did God say you were going to die? You're not going to die. You're going to go on forever. How are they going to do that? AI technology. Artificial intelligence. Download your emotions, your character, your memories. Download them into some kind of system that will hold you. And if you want to live forever, maybe we can put you in these cryogenic uh, uh, tanks and preserve you. Preserve your brain, maybe, and have you there. And then if you want to talk to your grandmother, you can just Zoom her up or Skype her up or whatever they're going to use. And her emotions and her uh, an avatar will speak through her, uh, as her, and it will just be her. And, and it's like you've never, you've never missed her before. You never miss her again. Uh, I don't know. Somebody was telling me. I don't know who it was. They got these... Um, it's crazy. They've got these VR goggles, virtual reality goggles, 
and, and this is to cope with, it's just to cope with bereavement. So if you lost your child, if you lost a loved one, you can, uh, a hologram can be brought into your virtual reality goggles and there's your son or your daughter that passed away or your grandmother or your mom and you can hug them and you can embrace them. You can have this discussion with them. Uh, even though they're dead, they can bring this reality, virtual reality into your, into your life as if they never left. They're continuing on. And they're bringing immortality. They say, we can live on forever now. We can slow down aging. Uh, by the way, they have AI churches, uh, artificial intelligence churches, blockchain churches, people that worship technology. They go and they, they bow at the feet of uh, zeros and ones, binary numbers, and because they believe technology will be their savior, that we can overcome even death by technology. Now, isn't that a modern? I mean, to me, it just seems like man is pushing the limit. Um, it's old news now, but uh, the, the, the language barrier that God, of course, we know the Tower of Babel, God confused the language. They stopped their building project because they couldn't communicate anymore. Mankind is bent, hell-bent, on reversing that uh, through AR technology. I can call, call my friend in Japan. This is old technology. It's even better now, but it's, it serves a purpose. I call my friend in Japan. I talk to him in English. He listens to it in Japanese. Talks to me in Japanese, I listen to it in English. There's no, no curse of language. The whole Tower of Babel's reverse. Now, what is God going to do? That's the question, right? Because the world is saying, well, what is God going to do? He's not going to do anything. Where is God? Turn to Book of Obadiah. Book of Obadiah. It's only one chapter. It's right before Jonah. And the Book of Obadiah is quite interesting. Obadiah... It's all about one little chapter, all about a judgment upon a nation. And it was the nation of Edom. Look at verse 3. Look at verse 3. The arrogance of your heart has deceived you. You who live up, way up on the rocks. Uh, one translation says the clefts of the rock into the loftiness of your dwelling place, who say in your heart, who's going to bring me down to earth? Now, who does that sound like? Like Obadiah is talking about Edom, and the Edomites had built an incredible fortress on a mountain. They didn't build a city like on the ground. They built it up on the mountains of Petra. It was a fort. It was a, a, a fort. It was formidable, and you couldn't destroy it. You will lose. And they had built it way up on a cleft, way up on the rock. Now, who built something already way up there, right? We just read it in Genesis, right? Same attitude, hundreds of years later. Verse 4, though you built high like the eagle, though you set your nest, your nest among the stars, you're getting up there, for where I will bring you down, declares the Lord. If thieves come to you, if robbers by night, how, will you, oh, how you will be ruined. Will they not steal only what they had enough? If grape gatherers came to you, will they not leave some gleanings? Oh, Esau, you will be ransacked. The word Edom, similar. It's basically the word for red. Edom is the word for dirt. It's the word for Adam. Adam, the red dirt man or the clay man. It's the same root as Edom. Edom, Adom, Edomite. The one who build way up there, God is going to bring them down. Now, it is speaking of the Edomites. Make no mistake about it. But it has so many similarities to mankind. And there's no coincidence that it is the name for Adam, the red one, the Edomites, the red mountains, the clay one. Man was made out of dirt, a dome. Uh, his name meant dirt, or his name meant a human, but also the one that came out of the ground. The one who built way up there, God's going to bring down Tower of Babel, fallen humanity, technology. There was another man who built really high, didn't he? Anybody know who this guy is? And it's found in the book of Daniel. This is a painting, of course. In the book of Daniel, chapter 4, it says, Nebuchadnezzar looked out into Babylon and says, isn't Babylon great? What I built, it's awesome. My paraphrase. And then an angel came down and says, you're going to be judged. And he became a beast. For seven years. And it says in Daniel, let's turn there, Daniel 4.24. It says in Daniel that God struck, it was, it was a strike of judgment. 
He was stricken with the mind of the beast. Oh, we got to finish. Sorry about that. Lost track of time a little bit. Verse 24. This is the interpretation, O king, and this is the decree of the Most High, which has come upon my Lord the King, that you have driven away from man, you were driven away from mankind, and your dwelling place will be the beasts of the field, and you'll be given grass to eat like the cattle, and be drenched with the dew of heaven, and seven periods of time will pass over you until you recognize that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind, and bestowed it on whoever he wishes. In that it was commanded to leave the stump with the roots of the tree, your kingdom will be assured to you after you recognize that it is heaven that rules. Therefore, O king, may my advice be pleasing to you. Break away now from your sins by doing righteousness and from your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor in case there may be a prolonging of your prosperity. So Daniel interprets this to, the, to Nebuchadnezzar. And the idea is that Nebuchadnezzar became a beast for seven years, but when he repented, he will be restored. He will be restored back. And this is what God is going to do to Nebuchadnezzar until he recognized that the Lord God is truly the only righteous, the only true rule, and he can give his kingdom whoever he wishes. The mind of the beast was given to a man, a man, Nebuchadnezzar, because he did not acknowledge God. So let's finish Psalm 115, and we'll, we'll have to meet again next week to deal with the rest of the chapter, because it is truly man wants to be in control. And man wants to ask the question, where is your God? Verse 2, the nations say, where is your God? We have our own gods. They're the idols. They're the idols that don't necessarily look like the old idols in the past, but they are very much alive today in our world. And mankind wants to control everything, wants to control our lives, wants to control heaven, wants to control everything about it. You see it in, in society today. Mankind is hell-bent on controlling everything. And yet, they cannot control God. They want to. They want to push him out. They want to replace him. And so here's the thing. God's people are like this today because the world and the nations are coming to believers and saying, where is your God? Look what we have. We have our technology. We have our space. We have our governments. We have our schools. We have our philosophy. We have our money. We have everything. What do you have? You have an invisible God. Woohoo. Well, if he is invisible then uh, where is he? And we say, well, God is spirit. doesn't need to be seen. Well, why isn't he acting like he used to? We have with these great biblical accounts of God's power. And that's what the Jews had. The Jews saying, well, look how God did. Psalm 114, I just told you everything about God. But where is he now? What is he doing now? Because we have our idols. And there is an, a magnificent response from the, uh, from the psalmist. We'll read that next week. In detail. But the psalmist is saying, you have your gods, and they're visible. Oh, you could see them. Technology, power, money, governments. You have your God, but they can't do anything for you. They're blind. They're dumb. They're mute. They cannot hear you, and they can't do anything for you. Our God, even though he's not visible, he operates in this world. He operates in our lives. And he's going to operate in a very powerful way very soon. Your gods that are visible, okay, they're visible, but they can't do anything. Our God is invisible, and he's about to enter into time and space again. And he's going to bring down where man wants to go, way up and be like God, and he's going to bring down that judgment because ultimately, and what the psalmist is going to end is, there's an image that is going to be on the earth. That image is God's image and likeness, humanity. But man, because he's God, he wants to be God, wants to create his own image on the earth. But something's going to happen to that image on the earth. 
What happened to God? He created mankind in his image and likeness. And mankind rebelled against God. Well, it's going to happen again. Mankind is going to try to create his own image on the earth. And that image is going to turn on men. And it's going to lead, it's going to, lead to a beastly end. What mankind wants to be God, they'll get a God. But what they're going to get is the God of this world in a human form. And he's going to give them an image, the image of the beast. So what mankind is building up for and what the governments of the earth and the nations of the earth want, an image, an image of themselves on this earth so they can be proud and get to the heavens and establish more rules, it's going to backfire. The beast, the mind of the beast is coming. But the psalmist has a great answer. And he says, trust in the Lord. O house of Aaron, trust in the Lord. Why did he call Aaron? Why did he, why did he specifically mention Aaron here? Did, yeah, but what did he do that had to do with idols? Remember what he did? Yeah, exactly. To those who have been meddling with idols, there's redemption. God brought him back. Can you imagine? He should have been dead. Idolatry was, he yeah, made a graven image. God had mercy on him. That's right, yeah. Somebody had to intercede for him. So in our idolatry and chasing after this, there was one who stepped in our place and interceded for us so that we wouldn't have to go in the way of the beast. And that's why he says, trust in the Lord. O house of Aaron, O house of Israel, those who fear the Lord, because the Lord has been mindful of us. He remembered us. And we'll talk about what that means because there's a beautiful gospel story in this, this part of the Psalms. But to remember that even the Jews had made those broken promises, they said that they were going to keep the word of God, they said they were going to keep the law, but they failed. And ultimately, the psalmist says, worship the living God. That's ultimately what we have to follow. It's the living God, not the dead idols of the world. And no matter how good they present them and no matter how good they try to polish them, they still were made by man. <laughs> they still were made by human hands. Technology, phones, all the technology that you find, everything that you have in this world, materialistic, it's all made by man. In fact, you know, it's the materialism in man that causes men to make material things, which by the getting involved in materialistic things, they become more materialistic. And it's just a vicious cycle and circle of man getting deeper and deeper into sin and into idolatry. And in steps in the gospel. Because the only way man's going to be saved, it's by God becoming a man. And stepping into that place. Otherwise, man will, un, will do and destroy themselves. So, worship the living God, the psalmist says, from this time forth and forevermore. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for the psalms, these two psalms that go together so tightly beautiful. Lord, I thank you for every blessing that you've given us through these texts, through these passages to help us understand your word, to help us understand the reality of where we live. The world says, where is your God? And Lord, I have to admit at times, it's formidable to present a gospel that requires faith in an invisible God. But Lord, we're not lost. We're not without proof. We have your word. We have your spirit. We have not only the history of Israel, Lord, but you move and you are moving in this world the salvation of our souls, the salvation of our family and friends and loved ones. Show us, Lord God, that you are active in this world despite your, in, your invisible. Lord, it says your invisible attributes are clearly seen. You operate in this world. And Lord, so help us to take this gospel to an invisible, to a, uh, a world that is, wants to see you, but it can only see you through the works of your people, Lord. So I thank you, Lord God, and I ask you to help us understand the rest of this chapter, the rest of the psalm, that's going to lead us right back into Jesus, that he is the author and the pioneer and the finisher of our faith. And Lord, I praise you tonight, and may your word 
sink deep into our hearts. And may we understand, Lord, the world in which we live in that is uh, idolatrous, that wants to lift up everything and anything at the expense of not loving other people and not loving people and the brethren. Lord, I pray that we as a church, Lord God, would have a heart like our Lord uh, to be made in his image and likeness and to be conformed into his image, Lord. We pray that you make us, Lord, uh, like you in a very real way in this world, that the world needs to see the body of Jesus on this earth. So, Lord, we ask you tonight to protect us and keep us safe. We praise you and thank you for Jesus. In his name we pray, amen.